So welcome to a special event as part of the end of the Grand Tour Virtual Symposium on Artist Residencies, State, Place, and Future. I am Francisco Guevara, co-executive director of Arquetopia Foundation. And I'm Nayeli Hernandez, programs coordinator. Today, we are presenting the book Contemporary Artist Residencies, Reclaiming Time and Space from Bali's and its series Atani Arts in Society. Editors, Taru Elfin, Irmeli Coco, and Pascal Gilen. Examine the present and potential, uh, potential function of the re of residencies for artists, the art world, and the society. Uh, and I want to introduce our guest uh, today, uh, Taru Elfing. Uh, she, her curatorial uh, work includes hours, years, eons, uh, from Finnish pavilion at the Venice uh, Biennale of 2015, Frontiers in Retreat, uh, HIAP, uh, 2013 to 2018, Contemporary Art Archipelago, CAA, and Towards a Future, Present, uh, Lofoten International Art Festival, 2008. Elping has published an extensive body of writing and co-edited uh, publications such as Altern Ecologies and the first Finnish anthology on curating Curatointi. She holds a PhD from Goldsmiths University of London and continues to lecture as well as supervise artistic research doctoral students at the University of the Arts Helsinki and elsewhere. Irmeli Koko uh, is a curator, producer and educator based in Helsinki in 1998, she initiated the HIAP Helsinki International Artist Program and worked there as director, chairman, and member of the board. She has started residency partnership programs for Finnish artists at The Frame and at the Academy of Fine Arts. She initiated a postgraduate residency program supported by the Sastamoinen Foundation. She was a board member of uh, the Res Artists and the expert group member of residencies at the Arts Council of Finland and the Nordic Council of Ministers. As a teacher and lecturer at the Academy of Fine Arts, she conceived the artist in society studies that reflects artistic work in relation to the art world practices and societal changes. She has curated alone and collaboratively several seminars and symposiums, and she holds an MA in cultural politi politics and art education from the University of Jyväskylä. Welcome and thank you for joining the symposium. Thank you. The virtual dialogue, the end of the grand tour, virtual symposium of artist residency, future pla uh, place and state, is focusing on the invention of place, mobility, tourism, and their historical roots as an open-ended question at the intersection of artist residencies, putting into relevance concepts such as dignity, solidarity, reciprocity, community, sustainability, and, so and social justice. In the book, Contemporary Artist Residencies, Reclaiming Time and Space, editors Taru Elfin and Irmeli Coco urgently convey us to continue critical discussions and radical experimentation in the face of uncertainty, which couldn't be more relevant than today. The end of the Grand Tour, organized by Arquetopia Foundation and Synergy ne uh, Residency Network in collaboration with multiple institutions around the globe, is the conversation that follows such as the parting point in an effort to continue the critical dialogue on the subject of artist residency. Although the Grand Tour is fairly vague construction that changed through the centuries, it, it has shaped ideas about destinations and gave origin to a long-lasting practice of traveling for education, personal development, and culture. A tradition that continues to resonate and that artist, res, uh, artist residencies have reclaimed. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, and especially in these tumultuous times, it is necessary to re-examine with a magnifying glass the limitations of sustainability alongside the legacy of history, including the dark implications of art in the invention of place as a fantasy product of the mutual investment of power and images. Some of the questions that trigger Archetopia's interest in putting together this symposium emerge from the book. And I quote, residencies may well present a potential for, for alternative, more sustainable economies of self-organization, but what does it take to nurture collectivity within the structures that allow and encourage us to be mobile in the present? Moreover, what is the impact, value, and potential of travel beyond network and career opportunities, for example, in terms of transformative encounters across disciplinary, cultural, and geographical boundaries? 
or how is it this how is this default model for an international career built on residency circulation implicating the economy of the arts more widely contemporary artist residencies is asking a question about time and space and i also pulled this quote from the book residencies for artists and curators have gained increasing significance with the ecosystem of contemporary art in recent years as crucial nodes in international circulation and career development, but also as invaluable infrastructures for critical thinking and artistic experimentation. Cross-cultural collaboration, interdisciplinary knowledge production and site-specific research. Meanwhile, the ongoing processes of wider societal changes, economic and geopolitical pressures, as well as the impact of ecological and humanitarian urgencies are affecting the arts, professional practices and mobility in ways that raise ever, ever more urgent questions concerning sustainability and access. In that sense, reclaiming should be understood in this context and in relation to the residency model discussed, not as a return. Rather, it has to do with active envisioning, sensing and making sense, and imagining into being. Moreover, it is crucial to avoid universalization as one never reclaims in general. What the time and space to be reclaimed is, and how these may happen in residencies and by diverse practitioners depends on the myriad vi uh, variables. This book, does not claim to offer a broad overview or generalizable conclusion, yet it does present a plurality of situated practices and reclaiming operations that connect with and at times also contradicts each other across a number of points. Against this background, the book Contemporary Artist Residences Reclaiming Time and Space asks, what is the present role of artist residences in the contemporary art ecosystem? How they meet the changing needs of individual artists? How can residencies provide alternative openings and infrastructures to nurture artistic work in the midst of current societal uh, transformations and environmental crisis? So we want to welcome our panelists uh, today. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Thank you. So um, we were thinking that I could just introduce a little bit uh, first, kind of how this book came about mm -hmm. uh, and, and sort of a little bit introduce that from, from our particular practices. Um, so, um, so Irmeli has, of course, been very involved in actually establishing and developing a lot of residency, artist residency uh, activities um, in, in Finland, in the Nordic region particularly, but also has been active for, for years in uh, international residency uh, organizations and, and discussions. Uh, my own background, then again, has been, um, as, um, my entry point into residencies, working with residencies has been as a curator. And a curator who you know, I've been mainly focused on working with artists on quite research-based um, projects, a uh, project where you don't really know what the outcome will be, if there will be an outcome, and, and, and to kind of really uh, trying to nurture uh, sort of critical dialogues and investigations into different sites uh, or contexts. And, uh, and this is sort of through this practice I discovered quite early on that residencies were the, really one of the only structures within the art world that supported this kind of work, uh, where you didn't have to have an exhibition in the end, or you might not know if you will have an exhibition in the end. And, uh, and, and so I ended up working quite a lot with residencies and, 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 and sort of testing out different ways of how, how you could bring artists together uh, into different contexts uh, and, and continue more long-term, uh, quite open-ended uh, projects uh, with artists. And, um, and so over the years, we ended up with Irmali, um, knowing each other and, and, and talking more and more in, in different uh, situations about residencies and also uh, realized that there was very little critical discourse on residencies. Although it was very clear that in the last 10 to 15 years or up to 20 years, there's been such a massive growth in residencies and the, and the role of residencies in the whole arts ecosystem. Uh, but there didn't seem to be very much critical uh, discourse written about residencies. Um, and, and if there was, it was individual articles rather than, than kind of bringing together different voices and positions. And so we became interested in thinking about uh, how to draw together and how to invite together different kinds of perspectives on residencies, but particularly focused on, on, on practice-based views. So rather than academic research on residencies, which is also a growing field now, we were really interested in coming from our own perspectives as well and our own practices on, on, on what is the kind of voice and the views of, of the people who are actually running residencies. Because there are so many um, 
practicalities. You know, it's very hands-on and it's very grounded. You know, the work when you work with residencies. It's. Uh, I think only through that practice aspect you can really understand the complexities and the differences that they have a lot to do with the different arts ecosystems and different other social contexts where you work. And um, and so this was the kind of starting point that we have. Uh, so we ended up having a number of conversations with different um, people who were also interested in interested in questions and, and who were working with residencies and, uh, and and ended up developing this symposium as a kind of um, as a, as a sort of a crown from where to start collecting uh, together. And, and, and so the symposium was one, but there were a number of smaller workshops and gatherings that actually uh, we were working uh, through over maybe two, three years at least, uh, before the book actually started to gain more kind of clearer form. And, uh, and of course, in the process, we also uh, realized that this is such a vast set of questions that, uh, that we were sort of dealing with or trying to address. Uh, that it became quite daunting as well to kind of think of how do we address something like this when there wasn't really a, a, the kind of crowd already, there wasn't really a published discourse to start with. Um, and, and, and so we are, um, so we're really aware that it became uh, kind of um, narrower in some ways and, and, and we couldn't include as many different kinds of perspectives or critical voices as of course we would have liked to. Uh, but it's been great to learn since the book was published that it has definitely done what we were hoping for. They would actually initiate further conversations mm -hmm. and further uh, also uh, uh, critical debates. And, and we hope that there will be a lot more books, you know, that also maybe challenge us, you know, challenge, mm -hmm. you know, for further different perspectives that we actually put together in this book. And and, and so um, I think this will pass on to Ira soon, who will introduce more of the our thinking and starting points behind the book, and and, uh, and then I'll go through the contents a little bit mm -hmm. more, different kinds of perspectives uh, that are there through the different writers. Um, but maybe just a few words about this time now where we are talking about this book now, that um, the, the kind of questions that really were driving us um, to, to sort of to bring together in this book were, had to do with, um, first of all, the kind of really strong believe that mobility and international mobility and exchange is really crucial in our time, the arts and, and beyond. Uh, and of course now with the kind of growing um, xenophobic nationalism everywhere in the world, you know, we're mm -hmm. very aware of how crucial it is that we keep these contacts. Um, but at the same time, ecologically, it, it's become very clear that we can't travel with that accelerated pace as we have been mm -hmm. doing in the world. Um, and, and so this conflict between these two views is something that we were we wanted to somehow address. And, and now I feel with the pandemic, it's become uh, even more clear that the complexity is at stake somehow and, and how at the same time, it's so necessary for us to be able to keep in contact. And, and, and not everything can be done virtually, although mm -hmm. it's amazing what we have been able to do virtually. Uh, but there is something to be said about people being able to meet, you know, and people mm -hmm. being able to really spend time in different contexts, understanding the different kinds of ecosystem social contexts where where their colleagues around the globe work. And and so it, it's this um I think with uh, the book in a way um sort of started touching upon these questions that have become even more tangible for all of us today in the last few months. Um but so I'm I we we'll really look forward to all those conversations and, and discussions that will come, you know, now mm -hmm. in, in the future when we actually have time to process what has happened and where we've ended up at the moment. I'll pass on the word to Irma now. Okay, so many important things already came out, but um, one of the things that uh, inspired or interested uh, us is also the certain kind of dialect way, dialectic way, how we speak about residences. On the other hand, they are like uh, unique places for artists to have own time. Uh, and the residences, they provide the resources for networks and, and interaction, like the classical residency model, which nucleus is on supporting creative work. Uh, on the other hand, at the same time, another kind of aspect emerged uh, alongside with the development of neoliberal uh, 
uh, economy and neoliberal, uh, especially cultural politics. And uh, this, um, uh, and also the third part, which is the, the, the kind of the art market, which were growing very strongly. Uh, I just wanted, would like to quote, quote give a quotation uh, of Natasha Perestin Bachelet's who wrote in her article, Reflexivity and Residency Programs in 2013. As Hito Steyer and Boris Burden underline, on the one hand, residencies help to increase deterritorialization and produce a model of the highly mobile cultural worker. On the other hand, they put forward relational performative work meetings, talks, net, networking, effective and symbolic labor, and not necessarily an art object economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he continues, uh, in the last few decades, artists, practitioners, and curators have been traveling so intensely that hopping from one city to another in search of ever new productions, relations, and ideas and accepting ever new invitations has become almost ridiculous today. There is a little difference between a business person and an art professional when it comes to the dictator. Um, uh, so uh, at the same time when, when uh, the, the idea of the residence is, is somehow still living, uh, also the kind of the difficult situation of, of creative workers today, or, or let's say before Corona time, the mm -hmm. internal situation has caused a kind of need for another kind of type of, of residences. And this was the notion that uh, there, at least in the Nordic sphere, in the Nordic countries, there's a wave of new small residences which go which, which resemble, which, which remind more uh, kind of a situation uh, fr uh, coming from the uh, colonial artist colony, uh, European artist colony uh, tradition, when, where, where artists in, in the end of the 19th century, they escaped to the countryside because the industrial revolution or industrialism kind of, uh, uh, they, it, uh, it was found really problematic both for the environment, socially, for working, and for creative work. And this kind of then gave, gave the impetus for artists to, to uh, form, to go to the countryside. At the moment, there are kind of signs that similar kind of, of, of symptoms were uh, going on. Well, just meant to mention some of the micro residency networks, some of the Mustarinda ecological based uh, pro ecological programs uh, or programs for small residencies. So, this was one of the kind of the starting point that how should the residencies reflect on the present situation, how they should kind of change their or should they change their way of working? Uh, and for that, uh, I would uh, like to just to say some open up some of the questions that we were talking about. They didn't come to the book, but anyway, we talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the question of creative communities. Uh, this is especially the kind of quotation of, of, of uh, Pascal's idea. Because Pascal uh, had done long-term research on artistic work and the changes in artistic work experienced by artists. And, uh, and so the, about the, the question of community in residences. Communities implicitly suggest that they are natural things. Communities are seen as social relationships which came to existence in an organic way. To feel respect, to build up trust relationships, free and spontaneous interactions are primordial. Trust is also a necessary condition to exchange fragile creative ideas 
and to discuss possible new artistic directions. But paradoxically, residency communities are most of the time not spontaneous at all because they are curated by the organizers of the residency who have their own selection mechanisms and criteria. When residencies are collective, they are open curated community. The residency are not only intellectual peers for each other, but can be also competitors for each other at the same time. Then secondly, question of artistic development. When the core function of residencies from the 19th zone has been to provide time and space for artistic development and production without specific expectation, the identity and ethics of residencies can be attached to this function. When ideological changes in the art education and humanistic university has formed the artist education to a result-based creative entrepreneurship programs, new educational programs are born out of the educational institutions. What are the possible futures of residencies in the educational context? Then, um, being an artist for three months is the third point. Uh, residencies have the potential meaning in supporting the professional self-identity of artists. It's also often the only time space in society where they are recognized and appreciated as an artist. In some other uh, professional or social context, they are both teachers or, or entrepreneurs or cultural managers or cultural leaders or art teachers. Uh, which, which means for an artist, in fact, the deep professionalization of her or his own skills, professional ethics and attitudes. A residency often reclaims the artistic profession as a valuable profession of its own. So the mm, uh, so against this kind of background, what what the artistic work is, what are the kind of conditions where the artistic work, where the artistic work happens and what is the role of residences in this in this realm. Uh, mm, uh, the, mm, mm, let me see. I think what is uh, really interesting that you you both put together also with, with Pascal in the book is how the tradition of residencies has been changing and the lack of critical discussions, not necessarily that they're not happening, but they're actually not being recorded. Uh, a lot of what happens in residencies is inside the residency and sometimes it comes out, but as you're mentioning, it's curated for the public and the value of the background, you know, the, the, not the background, the backstage work that is happening is uh, necessary to be reintroduced in the general discourse. And in that sense, what you're mentioning, how residencies expanded in, in, in the probably last 20 years, how they moved from, from cities to small areas uh, outside of, of, of the, the, the urban centers, how uh, creative workers uh, have chosen to open these spaces is really interesting because in that sense, a lot of discussion has happened through the years in, in scholarly work about residencies. But I don't think any book has addressed the backstage work because many of the artists also choose as creative workers to open these spaces, to reconnect. Uh, and also because of the neoliberal economy and how they have moved a lot of their weight, uh, infrastructural weight into residencies. You know, you know, what museums used to do now is also happening in residencies, or most often is happening in residencies and then going back to the museum because the infrastructure and, and the expenses are too high. So I, I think it's very interesting how you guys were able, how you thought of rethinking what is happening backstage? What is happening behind the scenes that opens up these discussions? Mm. Uh, yes, and one, one of the issues is also the uh, that if we come to the practices that were created in the 90s main, mainly, 
uh, that how they work for, and how they opened the residencies for international applications, how they how the artists are selected, and how this kind of the whole artistic work uh, started to demand to be on the road all the time, traveling constantly, and so uh, also that the artist in a way became a product. And residences, or some of the residences, or there is also the, the the feature in residences that it kind of lives through the artist presence. Who are the artists who are there? They kind of they get they get their funding. They get their they they. It's kind of question of money. It's a question of, of, of politics and strategies. And of course, everybody wants to a residency program. We need to fight to to be able to continue. So. Uh, in a way, what I find interesting is that also in the educational field, uh, there has been all the time really very much going on a discussion about the 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 the, on the directions where artist education is going to mm -hmm. the way to. And as we know all, the residencies and the uh, artist educational institutes they have a lot of of similar interests. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of educational ideology comes through uh, uh, same sources, let's say, for instance, like Black Mountain College experimentation, space, free space for experimentation. That's the kind of the really the very strong ethos in the 90s why residences were needed. They needed a free space for to experiment. And uh, this uh, this is still going on. It's still living very strongly this kind this uh, line, and luckily so. But anyway, so what I found interesting, also interested, so then after this book was came out, uh, there was some um, uh, very interesting conference where I was, and uh, the uh, uh, it was called revisiting Black Mountain College. And Dorothea Richter, who is uh, run the, running the uh, third career program in the Zurich University, she uh, it's also made a publication like it, which came out last January. But there, Dorothea Richter lists some of the ideas that how should be the educational sector or the practice of artist education change. And I think that there are some points that really very, very well fit also to residency programs, how they could renew their attitude. And also like some writers in the book, like Donna Linus, has kind of done actively the changes uh, of, of changing the 90s model into a second phase and we, in, in practice. and and. Uh, some of I would like to just say some of the points that Dorothea Ritter brings out. Uh, she, in fact, bases her notions on Ahmed Ödül's Silent University art uh, mm -hmm. project, which is an ongoing project for free university in a way. But anyway, uh, the first notion that Ritter kind of presence as, the, as an attitude to change artist education is participation, not representation. Mm -hmm. Re, we can move it directly to residences. Mm -hmm. Residences are for participation, not for representation. Uh, then she talk, talks about the potential role of residences transforming social and political order or the global art the, of the, of the, of the uh, social reality. Uh, sorry, I mixed. She talks about art universities, but I changed it into kind of applied it. But uh, the potential role of residencies transforming social and political order of the global art world. So it has also residencies for the counter force for the global art world and the, the kind of uh, which is much wider and much cruel than the residencies ever are. Uh, I think Jean Pakistoli is really right in, in, in claiming that 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 residences in every situation they are so marginal that they can always be repeated in a way. You can always, if you really want, you can do with residences as much as you can. And uh, 
and this is something that it uh, needs to be. We need to kind of give a kind of site and location that is that will be, or that's what we very strongly all think about. Was we are thinking about when planning the book that we need that there is a huge need for spaces for uh, free thinking and own time. Uh, then. Uh, um, and then working together, self-empowered learning, uh, which, we, which comes to the uh, to the uh, position of artists in the residency who are working there. Uh, are they? Can they have an influence to the programming of the residency? Because the influence of or the role from the from, from the representative of the residency to the partic part, uh, participant mm -hmm. of the residency also may have practical conditions, practical consequences, which uh, can affect, have an influence to the programming. Uh, this again, I would like to talk about Duna Linus, who in Wising Art Center uh, managed to renew all her programming by starting to listen to what artists said. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I want to connect these ideas uh, with the process of selecting the, the authors, those who contributed to the book, because this idea of uh, participation versus representation is, is very interesting to think about how the voices of many residencies or specific residencies um, have been uh, curated, filtered, or have not been able to access um, the main discourse or the main discussions. And uh, in the book, the selection of voices, the selections of perspectives is very wide and it opens uh, really these questions about time and space. How did you select the scholars? How did you choose uh, also the organization of the book? Um, I guess um, I could sort of jump in here. Um, the selection really happened through the process. So actually all of these people who ended up contributing had been in some conversation with us in different symposia or, or other gatherings. And, and so it really came through this process of, of talking with people and, uh, and, and meeting people in different contexts where we actually had a chance to talk and really have a proper conversation about residencies. And, and then coming together, uh, together with Pascal as well and thinking about, so what are the kind of key themes that we need to somehow address? And, and, and started thinking of who are the people who have been working with these questions in different parts of the world. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so it, there were more, uh, more sort of writers on list, but then of course, you know how it happens, especially with people who are running residencies, you know, the okay. time schedules become impossible and then some people kind of dropped out. Uh, but so, um, so in, in many ways it is very subjective as well. It's really through, uh, rather than doing kind of research, you know, on, on different people who've been writing about residencies, we really started from conversations. So we started mm -hmm. from actually, from, you know, having conversations and, and find that these people have interesting different perspectives from the practice-based position. And, and so because there's actually, as you know, when you're running residencies, there's most people don't have a huge amount of time to do a load of writing and research at the same time. So there's a... Uh, so we really wanted to also kind of trust and follow our our instincts in a way, in that sense that uh, that there were people who had a lot to say, but hadn't really necessarily had the space to publish that. Mm. Mm. Yes, and on the, on the other hand, uh, there was the the problem. It was also the Eurocentric view, uh, which was very narrow. The kind of what the, the let's say that the whole whole field of the resident global residency. We, from the beginning, we realized we don't have we, we don't have the expertise, we don't have the connections. We we are ourselves very very Eurocentric, and uh, uh, what would I and, and somehow it's uh, uh, it's a coincidence that it happened then that now, for instance, you know Pau Kata, Pau Kata, so he has now been uh, working in his uh, PhD doctoral PhD studies, studies mm -hmm. on, on, on the uh, alternative narratives of the history of residences, mm -hmm. which then kind of gives the kind of site 
to another kind of way that we even could not mm -hmm. and weren't able to think about. And we no, didn't then know who, who could. Mm -hmm. So we then select to be honest with it, that we are so beyond narrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and we didn't even have no view wasn't there as well or present. Mm -hmm. I think there was, there was, in the end, that became quite uh, intentional because we also felt that it was quite a yeah. set of voices when actually, uh, after all, us as editors, we we had a limited, grounded perspective in many ways. And and so we kind of um, also articulated this, you know, with the book that we really hope that this is a starting point, that this actually encourages, you know, further further discourse to be you know, produced and published. Mm. Uh, but it was something that came up a lot in our conversations that we felt that in terms of left, uh, content, it was really critical that we address this issue that the residencies are, uh, the re circulation of artists in residencies reflects the uh, unequal access uh, to the art world circulation globally. Uh, there's still very, very much uh, uh, the kind of majority of artists circulating globally, uh, European or North American. Uh, most of the residencies are still uh, in, in North America and, and, and Europe, although it's changing. Uh, but also the fact is that the borders are there often one way, you know, one way from Europe or North America, you have you have access with funding, but also the borders are open. Mm -hmm. uh, coming from a lot of parts of the world to Europe, to residencies, uh, it, it become, it's a massive challenge even just to get a visa, even if you manage to yep. gain funding. And so uh, these things have to be addressed somehow. And, and so we want to definitely to take this into account because I think the, this is the kind of sec uh, the ecological question is one really crucial thing that we all have to address. But the second thing is the fact that it, it, there's extreme privilege that drives the art world, you know, and, and, and the residencies are definitely impacted by that. And, and, and so even if residencies are open and can support artists who don't have those funds and resources to, uh, that they could otherwise circulate, it actually puts them in quite precarious position as well. So there's a lot of artists who are also dependent on residencies in a way. Yeah. So it becomes a kind of survival uh, mechanism for some, whereas some can choose to travel and others are more or less forced into that in order for them to be able to continue practicing as artists and making them out of that. Mm. And these were the things that we felt that was really crucial to bring up in the book. Well. Yeah. Right. And, and I think what is very relevant is this question of mobility, because when, when we think about the history, the recent history of uh, residencies, it definitely can be uh, connected to the 90s and specifically how mobility changed in the 90s. First of all, when the European Union was constituted as a space that is open for everyone in Europe, but is closed to most everyone outside of Europe. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to think about how places were reinvented because this tradition of traveling uh, through any space, uh, which becomes place through the, through the way of seeing, is something that we are very familiar with in other places like Latin America. You know, the tradition of uh, Europeans coming to Latin America and describing and illustrating and inventing all these fantasies is a long-lasting tradition. So uh, when we rethink these uh, questions, it's fascinating because I, I want to connect it with what you mentioned before. What do we do to rethink what is the next step or, or how do we see residences in the future when we see the rise of nationalism? How do we envision communities? How do we see the role of these residences of many uh, tiny, uh, micro, even larger residencies in certain communities, and they begin serving these communities in ways that the infrastructure of the specific community couldn't allow them to uh, previously. So it's not only the possibility of bringing artists into the space, it's actually how these uh, residencies become nodes and intersections of visions where artists also come to learn, come to see and understand differently, and not only because of the residency, but because of the community. So I, I want to ask the question, what do you foresee in terms of community versus nationalism? Um, I guess the question is, like, what, what is the community? You know, that are, yeah. I think in terms of the community of artists, uh, I see residencies as really crucial when actually they can be 
going to the next stage of the world, you know, that you can not, not all the artists can travel uh, or want to travel for various reasons, you know, for whether they are also personal reasons. And, uh, uh, and I think the way that our residencies have had a really positive impact in many ways is how they've actually connected artists across the globe. So there's been a kind of global artist community has been formed partly through these connections when people have spent together three to six months in a residency in a new place, they've actually formed friendships and relationships that last. And, and so it's actually really supported this kind of peer-to-peer -peer networks uh, and, and real friendship-based, you know, kind of dialogues uh, between artists. Uh, and also allowed local communities of artists, you know, to kind of to have uh, sort of a point of connection to the world, to different places, to different practices to, with the artists who come to visit. Uh, but there's a balance of when actually the kind of, um, how do you make this really happen? How do you make this sort of the local communities of artists or the wider community to have a really a, a proper relationship and conversations and dialogue with the, with the artists who are visiting? And, and what are the kind of mediations and infrastructures that are needed for that? Uh, and in smaller communities, of course, we know that there's this, you know, the fatigue sets in at some point with the local community when there's an artist comes every three months who's super interested about everything, what they do, you know, fishing, whatever local, you know, uh, traditions or the, the local livelihoods and, and ways of life. Um, then it becomes really uh, close to a kind of problematic aspect of tourism where there's a constant demand of, of kind of um, sharing your culture uh, with the visiting artist who then take bits with them, you know, and it's a kind of extractive mode of uh, artist production as well that can be extremely problematic. So I think that kind of whole relationship of how do we make sure that actually there is a real exchange that, that those parties are gaining something from. Uh, rather than also that there are residencies being established now with a very particular kind of um, sort of gentrification logic in mind and, and also the idea that we have international artists coming in that it somehow boosts the value of the local community develops tourism whatever and, and so then also the artist in residence can be used in a way in, in, for particular kind of other other purposes so I think that relationship is extremely complicated and I think there should be a, a lot more emphasis on just thinking about what are the practices and how do we make sure that there's actually a real um, sort of a long-term positive impact if they think of it. Hmm. Yeah. I think that you, Frances, first of all, you wrote about this in your mm -hmm. art and how Alpha works and how much effort you have done for, for kind of uniting or making the local art scene equal to the to the guest artists or mm -hmm. I mean to make a kind of a community where, where all our participants not only not only those who are artists coming to the residency, but also people who are uh, in the local scene or in the local cultural uh, uh, traditions. What I find problematic is how contemporary art is defined, or how 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 who is a contemporary artist is it's a difficult question, and it's a cultural issue. Mm -hmm. But the some this. Um, uh, in my mind, the ec ecological ethos of residency should be based on, uh, as as the nature is on by their by by their, their diverse. biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So it's also that the it should be the similar thing to in art that it's it's not only contemporary art is not the one way one way though that there are many kind of contemporary arts in the world. It's kind of this post diversity that is necessary mm -hmm. for us to kind of have more equal encounters, I guess, and exchanges in, in some ways. Yeah, and yeah. to get to this kind of a trustful interaction is, is a really big and important challenge. Yes, absolutely. I, I think the, the questions that we were uh, thinking about when we started the this presentation are connected to to the question of biodiversity, how uh, Eurocentric ideas have failed. And it, it's clear that we need to move to uh, out of that place to re-understand biodiversity as a responsibility that we have, a larger responsibility that we have. And in that sense, I want to ask you, what do you think would be 
the next uh, possibility of reconnecting. In that sense, the, the idea of traditional networks that emerge in the 90s, uh, similar to how uh, the United Nations had a specific, or even UNESCO had a specific role in culture, has changed. So in terms of biodiversity and ecosystem, how do you see uh, this possibility of reconnecting with the different topography? What is the next step? As, as we know, uh, this system has failed and it has forced us to go back to our homes and stay there for several months. So it's a moment where we have to rethink that what we're doing is probably not the best thing that we could do. So how do you foresee the possibility of reconnecting and establishing a larger community in terms of residences? One, one, one thing that comes to mind is a conversation I had in the Res Artists conference, um, and was that a year and a half ago that we were with the Emily and uh, presenting the book, and, um, and I was talking with some Southeast Asian uh, colleagues who were saying that one of the big problems that they have is that they don't have any support structures for artists to uh, travel between the countries there. So there's a lot of support structures for artists to come to Europe, to the big centers, of the, the global centers of the art world, but actually for, you know, to support an artist to go from, you know, from one country to the next door, there aren't support structures for that. And, every, and, and the way that actually the art world has been operating, that everybody has to go through the big nodes, you know, the big global centers, has, uh, has been extremely problematic. And, and I think that's where we have to start now, also ecologically, to try to think of how do we actually cr recreate stronger regional connections? And then from those regional kind of connections and, 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 and sense of collectivity, uh, then to kind of connect beyond those regions. And, and, and I think there's a, that's also something that um, now in Europe, when we're thinking again a lot more of kind of how, could, how do we travel otherwise than by flight? You know, from Finland, it's really far away to go anywhere in Europe, to be honest, you know, if you have to take a train, but it's possible. But actually what it does then is that you become aware of all the places in between. So rather than taking a flight to London, you travel through all the neighboring countries and, and you can actually think of your... Uh, connections to uh, these places and to the colleagues around, you know, these sort of uh, regional areas in a different way. So I think what, what, what we'll have to start thinking about is how do we actually connect regionally first and, and really start strengthening those connections. And then, um, but at the same time, I'm really concerned about this becoming again, a kind of um, creating more barriers and, 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 and somehow dividing globally because the distances are so vast. That how do we then actually make sure that we do keep a kind of a more uh, global connections and, and a sense of global global community? It's it's, it's going to be really really challenging when we can't fly the same way anymore as, as what we have been doing. Um, but Irmeli, what do you think? Mm. I don't know. It's a it's a complicated issue, but it, this is not the first time when the borders are mm. closed, uh, and also the artist mobility has been has been controlled or always. Mm -hmm. And uh, there have been different phases when, uh, of, of mobility, uh, when, when they have been strongly supported and de depending on much of the needs of the whole cultural field of certain area or region. And, and uh, for instance, in Finland, in the end of the 19th century, from the 60s, from the 40s to the 90s uh, uh, in the 19th century, uh, all artists were traveling abroad because there was no education, artist, artist education as such in Finland. So they, they, everybody were, were the first kind of uh, uh, subsidy funding was directed to traveling. And then uh, after the, uh, the nationalist uh, movement which led to the independence, it became very uh, uh, Yeah, it was seen negative. I yeah, guess. it was seen very, very negative uh, that fin fin that artists were supported to go abroad. And uh, then it changed, it changed it again, and then after Cold War, then it started again, then now I can yeah. for 30 years, very, the, uh, all European countries, all, almost all, all the, uh, there are several foundations who support artist mobility. Right. I'm afraid what will happen now, because the, the um, 
um, because in all everywhere we are dependent on on policies and and how the uh, decision makers the, how they are uh, and that's the economics the economics is going down and and it's going to be a worldwide uh, problem with the economics plus climate change and then I see it anyway a necessary thing that there should be connections it should be open there should be traveling in one way or another in a more more ecological way it's necessary for everybody for science for learning for art everybody and for kind of keeping the world somehow uh, in connection with each other and it's for the it's for peace very very sure. important <laughs> and so uh, what what i would expect the decision makers do and the united nations to start by the really conscious in a conscious way starting to support another kind of mobility programs a plan good schemes when considering artists mobility in in the in the world where we are now mm -hmm. and also consider that this kind of the the whole what you said about this eurocentric and european traveling to go uh, uh, <laughs> where <laughs> to see or or to know the world which is of, of course it's good but it has to be kind of pre uh, and small and pre 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 Really? It has to be in two right? ways, in, in yeah. both ways. Yeah. Yeah. Reciprocal. Yes, reciprocal. Yes, yes, yeah. reciprocal. Yes. Yeah. So it, it's it's really unequal, and it's it's uh, it can cannot continue like mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. and I think otherwise yeah. the kind of the meaningful traveling lost loses its sense, mm -hmm. the, because the corona kind of. Uh, uh, made us or made us to a situation where we have to uh, define or find again kind of the meaning of traveling. Why, why, why to travel? Why to do go to residencies? Mm -hmm. Why to why why to invite anybody? Why to kind of why why to try to uh, provide spaces for international communities or or, or whatever? Mm -hmm. And so so. Uh, that, that it has to be meaningful traveling. It cannot be kind of anymore the kind of hopping from town to town, city to city, or or, or it can be, but it's unmeaningful. Mm -hmm. Somebody can finance it, but mm -hmm. this kind of public funding, let's say the whole public sphere is an interesting thing uh, for residences because in fact residences don't have such a place in the public sphere. It's un it's not defined <laughs> right right and i think this is this is also why the book came out of finland because this is right. a very fresh perspective when we think about the history of europe when we think about um similarities in uh experiences th these are the kinds of voices that are needed how uh finding this book um it makes sense that it's coming out of finland it makes sense uh, as you're explaining how all these questions have to be um open-ended questions because traveling is necessary, but we also need to understand how it is performing uh, as a necessity because that's that's a different question. And in that sense, I want to connect with these two open-ended questions. It's not necessarily that we have an answer to them, uh, but you both have touched on, on elements of, of these two questions. How can we facilitate movement in the cultural sector, making sure cultural mobility does not become cultural trafficking um, and movement at the expense of exploitation? And also, how can we exercise reciprocity and solidarity among our artists' residencies? Right. That's yeah. the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently, and, uh, and this pandemic has in, in many ways kind of uh, uh, helped the thinking, uh, is to kind of, how, how can we slow down? How can all of our institutions, all of our activities slow down? Uh, radically. That is the only way we can actually tackle climate change, is that basically all of our societies need to slow down. Uh, and this sort of accelerated uh, mobility and circulation and production. And it's the same thing in the art world. And a lot of uh, artists are really struggling with the constant necessity to produce. Uh, and, uh, and organizations are struggling with the constant necessity to uh, come up with new projects that you can get project funding for and then you have to kind of come up with the next project. So this kind of project uh, logic 
uh, combined with the kind of attention economy that we're in as well at the moment, it, it makes it extremely difficult for any of us to really focus long term on anything. And, and I think that's why residencies are extremely crucial on, on actually the only platform that we have left in the arts uh, where there's a real emphasis on more long term. You, put, you can actually pause somewhere for a few months rather than hopping in there for three days. Or, and you can, you can sort of take that time uh, for other things than having to produce really fast something. So it's kind of resistance to that necessity to produce and to make residences productive in, in, as part of the kind of art world production machine and the market is really crucial. Uh, but I think that sort of investment in that, how can we actually travel less, but really take time to travel and, and to take time to be somewhere uh, is crucial. But also then uh, that needs to be resourced well enough that actually the artists and, and art practitioners are able to take that time. Uh, but the other thing is connected to that is um, more the kind of long-term connections that is it possible to think that rather than um, going to new residencies every year uh, or every few years that uh, can we somehow try to develop more long-term partnerships also between organizations that we can really develop a very long-term partnerships you know for let's say 10 years of, of working together and having a dialogue and and this is actually something that i've been working with scientists recently on environmental scientists uh, the kind of question of temporality comes up a lot because they are working with, they need to work on something 40 years at least before they have enough data to be able to analyze what, how, how ecosystems are changing. And, and they need to develop this sort of really long-term uh, collaborations and partnerships and research in different sites. And I've been thinking of how, it's made me really realize how fast-paced we are in the arts at the moment. And, and how this um, how there's very few support structures for artists to really just be you know put in one place and work very kind of you know very with a focus and intimately with one community or one place and and they become invisible in that we don't see these practices in the inter international sphere at all because they don't travel because the artists don't travel and the artworks are not traveling enough because they're very much uh, sort of site specific in very concrete terms. And, and, and committed to these local contexts. And so I'm kind of interested in how could residencies support dialogue between these kinds of practices? How can we somehow share our understanding and really grounded, situated knowledge from different uh, contexts through residency uh, and other arts activities? Is there a way that we can somehow, that that mobility that happens is, is somehow really uh, developing long-term and really sort of uh, strong connections between different sites without having to have huge amounts of people traveling constantly between different places. Mm -hmm. So these are really kind of questions. I have. Um, I don't have kind of answers of how do we do this, but they're not very complicated things. And, and I think after all, I think we've only been really traveling with this accelerated pace for the last 20 years, 30 years now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, before that, there was a very different logic to how yes. And I think something very interesting that uh, you you mentioned is how residencies become this sort of in between space between public and private, because it is it is fascinating to think what is happening in the intimacy of of residencies, and then also that connection with public space and nationalism. So. If you could both expand on the potential of residencies, because I think this is a question that it connects directly to the future of residencies. How this space in between public and private could allow things to be different. Right. Yes. I, I think exactly the same way that one of the, uh, it's, it's in a way, a residency is a shelter from the public space. At the same time, uh, residency as an organization or an institutional form, it's also in the public space. So it's something in between and, and really kind of uh, uh, the way how it is in the public space uh, depends on the resident, future of residencies, depends so much on them. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, one mm -hmm. thing that we also discussed in the making of the book was this whole notion of residence, that the kind of resident, in a way, mm -hmm. already suggests somebody being in residence, being, uh, in a way, temp you know, 
momentarily at least at home somewhere, living somewhere. And what does that mean? What does the kind of that kind of being based somewhere, be living in a place, what kind of uh, role does that bring? Also, what kind of a civic role does that you know bring with it? You know, what kind of responsibilities? Uh, when you're granted residence, what does that mean? You know, and uh, and how do you gain that kind of status? And 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 what is so? I think that exactly moves there between that there isn't the kind of a there's the home a private that is not political and public, but there is always, of course, you know, we know from feminism that that the um, private is definitely very much political, mm. and as so personal is political. Mm. So how do we kind of actually see this connection mm. that are uh, that that what is what happens then? How can the residency organisations can maybe more as well uh, support that interface uh, mm. between between mm. the kind of public civic mm. sphere and and the kind of the, the sort of private workspace? Mm. In a way, one one would think that uh, if we would give up of the word uh, residency, mm. uh, the, it could be a kind of site or a place or where. Where artists, uh, where, where time and space and artist production and research is together, mm-hmm. and and uh, uh, is it any more important than the residency that there are links to really kind of that there is still uh, artists living uh, that the home kind of mm. aspect is there? Is it necessary or not? Or could it be possible that residencies, what are today, they would be kind of sites or nods that would connect artists locally uh, from different aspects? And this kind of the, the connection of, could happen during five years or six years or three years or something. And it's not kind of the three months, six months, four months, mm-hmm. but it would be a kind of catalysator of the, of the whole area and, and playing with uh, and, and using the time as the aspect of a kind of, of, an, of an, uh, the way, let's say that the artist, the, the methods of residences, but without the idea of the format of residence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. This has been a wonderful conversation and it adds a lot of context to understand what is a residency? Uh, what is? Why are we thinking about residencies uh, more than ever? And, and I think you both have mentioned how this idea of public and private is uh, spaces is, is 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 very interesting and complicated at the same time. Also, how residencies have functioned uh, specifically after the or from the '90s on to take on a larger portion of infrastructure how they become spaces where people meet. You know, it is uh, a central question of the encounter and space and time, which which is something very complicated also to think about because we all experience space and time differently. And also how we connect these uh, questions, open-ended questions to the invention of place, to the tradition of moving, to the act of traveling. So I want to thank you both for taking uh, the time. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. Mm-hmm. Is there something you would like to add? Well, thank you for thank uh, you. inviting us. And, yes. uh, and we really look Very forward much. to uh, hearing all the other, other presentations in the near future. And, uh, and, and it's great that we're just really grateful that, that the book continues to have a meaningful life, you know, and, and initiate further conversations. So that's really uh, been the kind of key aim for us anyway. So, uh, so to be continued. Absolutely, absolutely. And if you could tell our audience where they could find the book yeah. so that if anyone who's interested could actually get it. I think, I think yeah. from the, the Valleys, you can order it from Valleys. And mm-hmm. then I think they also, it also, it is in, uh, it's in, uh, in the Art University. But I yes. think that if you Google the book, you can mm-hmm. find the sources where, where you can order it, because I think there should be several several places where you can order it. It's also online. You can also download it online uh, from the University of the Arts Helsinki. Uh, because it has been part produced and um, published by the University of the Arts, and, and they make all of their publications online uh, free, available. So, Wonderful. 
So it's also there's there's a kind of aspect of mobility that is really wonderful about how we can publish and share things these mm -hmm. days. Absolutely, and we will make sure to add the link so that anyone who's interested in the book can actually download it or also get a copy, a physical copy of the book. So thank you again thank for taking you. the time uh, for discussing um, all these important questions. And I look forward, we both look forward to seeing you in person sometime soon. Yes, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.